Bloom interview with Rick Emmett. More info at fullbloom.com. How have you been doing during the pandemic? Um, it's had its challenges, but it's not been too bad for me personally. My uh, 92-year-old dad is in a home, and that created a lot of sort of issues just because can't really get in to see him, and he, he's suffering from some dementia, so pretty hard to communicate with him over the phone about certain kinds of things. But uh, generally speaking, I, I, you know, I've been able to sort of get away with my own kids and grandkids for a, a holiday at a cottage, and from a sort of a business point of view, I mean, I retired from touring almost like a year and a half ago, but you know, Roundhill's putting out my stuff, and so now I'm on Zoom meetings all the time, and I've been teaching uh, in a workshop for songwriting last weekend on Zoom, and I wrote a book of poetry, and I'm talking to publishers, and it looks like I'm going to get a deal there, and so it's like, even though it's been weird times socially, it's kind of been an interesting creative time for me. As far as business goes, there really wasn't anything that changed? Uh, well, because I was already retired from touring, that, you know, it, it didn't make one whit of difference that right. way. Yeah, I mean, uh, my life, it's, I, I, you know, as I've said in many circumstances, I retired from touring, I didn't retire from being creative. So... I still, uh, I've ended up having writing sessions with people, and and uh, I got a guy coming over here on um, Thursday tomorrow, and we're going to do a, a a recording of a session of some country guitar picking fun. So, you know, it, yeah, it hasn't been too bad at all. Roundhill Records, they reissued eleven albums from your solo catalog in digital format. Were those not available prior to this, or have they been remastered or anything? Uh, some of them, well, in the, over the course of their lives, like when I would first release records, I would make an effort to try and make sure it was available in different places. And of course, I would be manufacturing CDs up for when we would go out on the road to play gigs and stuff. So I would have physical product. You could always download off of my own site, uh, off com. They were always available. But um, we're talking about you know, uh, albums that go back to about 1996. So that's a fair run of time. And um, over time, if I had partnered the project with somebody else, like some of them were just mine, you know, I owned them 100%, all the copyright and the masters and the publishing and everything. So I would just continue to offer those as downloads off my site because it was an uncomplicated kind of thing. If I partnered with somebody else, and I did a bunch that were with um, Dave Dunlop, they, we called it Strung Out Troubadours, and there were three of those. And there was one I'd done with a pal of mine named Mike Schott, and it was a hard rock kind of a record. The Airtime Liberty, Liberty Manifesto. Manifesto. Yeah, yeah. So those ones, after a certain period of time, you know, a few years, I would kind of lose interest in, I'd be moving on to something else, and I didn't want to have to be bothered accounting to third parties anymore, you know, having to do all of the paperwork of, okay, this sold this many downloads, and oh, I went out on a tour, and I, you know, we sold this many CDs at the merch table. That was just a pain in the ass. So I said, okay, I don't want to do that anymore. And so I stopped doing them off my website. The extension of that was, okay, are we going to be pursuing things like iTunes and now all these streaming services like Pandora and Spotify and blah, blah, blah? No, I don't care. So when Roundhill came around, that was one of the first things they said, oh, well, that's the first thing we're going to do is we're going to digitally re-release them and get them up on the streaming services and iTunes and all of that. So I went, hey, you know, great, go for it. Is there any plan to re-release that stuff on the CD or vinyl? Well, I would think that logic uh, and reason sort of dictates that what Roundhill will do is see how it goes. If they feel like I'm, you know, uh, having fantastic interviews with guys like Adam and, <laughs> and there's lots of activity in the downloading of these things, I think they'll probably go, hey, yeah, you know what, let's, you know, let's think about repackaging and reissuing and let's go, let's go to the more expensive formats and blah, blah, blah. If, you know, if it's a modest thing, they might go, well, let's just stay modest, you know. I, I, I I honestly think it's kind of like, a, in a way, it's it's uh, reflecting the, the, the COVID pandemic times. It's like, you can't really think too far ahead. You really just kind of, it's like a game of golf, right? You, you hit it and you go and find where it lies and play it where it lies. You know, like, you're just kind of going day by day and stroke by stroke. There's also folk songs for the Farewell Bonfire. That's the new collection of stuff, and... 
it was a new approach for me in that I kind of went, all right, uh, I'll kind of clean house here because uh, who knows if I'm going to keep doing this or not. And let's see if doing it a certain way is something that I like and, and that if people like. And the 18 songs that are vocal and just guitar and six kind of fingerstyle jazz guitar pieces. So 24 new pieces of music available for download off my site. And, you know, we'll see how that goes. I liked it. I enjoyed the process of, the, like, I never stop writing. I'm always writing. So I can see stuff accumulating again. But just the whole idea of, um, are you taking piggies to market? Like, marketing is a whole different thing than creating and right. performing. You know, if one grows sick of things in the music business, chances are they're probably going to get more sick of the marketing stuff sooner than they get sick of the writing and the playing. For anybody who doesn't know, and you already mentioned it, but the Airtime Liberty Manifesto, for fans of kind of your heavy rock era, that should satiate them. Yeah, that was right around when uh, the guy that I worked with, Mike Schotten, he was kind of a genius with Pro Tools, and that was a very Pro Tools kind of project. It, it got tons of guitar overdubs and lots and lots of vocal layering, and, and uh, Mike's a drummer. But he also, he's sort of a multi-instrumentalist. But in the end, it sounded like a, you know, a rock band that has 14 guys in it. Right, so, very progressive. Yeah, but it, it was heavy, too. It was, it was like almost like a prog metal, almost. Right. Has your songwriting process always been the same, or has it evolved from, say, your days in Triumph to your early solo career to nowadays? Well, <laughs> I just turned 67 a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Congratulations. I've been writing songs since I was 10 years old. So that's 57 years of writing. I'm not sure one could put it on a bar graph and say, oh, yes, it's been a steady evolution. You know, I think what tends to happen with creative endeavors is that they do become cyclical or they circle back on themselves. For example, this new project, Folk Songs for the Farewell Bonfire, I'm going right back to my roots when I was a kid playing coffee houses and, you know, doing cover versions of other people's folk songs and guitar pieces and stuff. So, you know, that's almost like a devolution as opposed to an evolution. But, I, you know, I mean, I sort of got to the point after writing in Triumph and having success and being on billboard charts and stuff, then opportunities come along where people say, hey, w would you like to be on the board of the Songwriters Association of Canada? And, Geez, we could really use somebody to be sort of the chairman of the committee for, you know, education. Would you be on the education committee? And one thing leads to another. I said, on the advisory board for the uh, Humber College Music Program, and at a certain point they said to me, you'd be a terrific guy to teach our music business course. Smooch, smooch. And, and uh, I, you know, my ego, I got sucked into it. So, you know, uh, I would be teaching in the college part-time at the beginnings of weeks and then, you know, climbing on an airplane and going out on the road on weekends. And uh, that was my life for a couple of decades. So there's that whole thing of being academic and, and a business course and having to teach the whole, uh, every student in the program. That became fairly onerous. I got to the point where I was like, man, I don't know, like, maybe you should get somebody else to start helping me teach this business thing. And, I'd like to teach songwriting. That would be kind of fun and a little more creative and smaller groups of students. And that sort of became what I gravitated towards over the course of two decades there. And of course, the Songwriters Association, they would still ask me to participate in the teaching workshops on certain weekends. And the Humber asked me to start a program which was called Song Studio, which was a summer songwriting workshop, which... I've sort of divested myself of the administration of it, but they still ask me every year, hey, will you come back and, you know, be director emer emeritus? And so I go, yeah, all right. You know, <laughs> and, and, but it's fun. I don't want to make it sound like it's a tremendous burden, but um, I still do that from time to time, but I don't teach at the college anymore. I retired from that as well. I've sort of reached the age and stage where I'm, I'm going back through my hard drives and I'm looking at all of the things that I've written courses and, and, you know, I've got dozens and dozens of lectures and things. And, you know, at some point, as I said to you at the beginning, I've made a deal. looks like I've made a deal for putting out a poetry book and a memoir. And so if that goes well, then I might sort of gravitate that on over towards all this other material that I have, which is educational in nature, which is sort of about 
my perspective on the music business and my perspective on songwriting. And of course, I also wrote a column for Guitar Player Magazine for 13 years. So there's also that aspect to my career, which is, you know, sort of a guitar player of some distinction, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know. So there, there may be some guitar stuff in there too, right? you know, who knows. Do you typically start out writing on, say, an acoustic guitar and then kind of uh, mouth the melody over it? That's certainly one way, Adam. And, and you know, uh, I would say when I first started, uh, I was learning how to play guitar. I'd learn a few chords and then I'd go, hey, you know, uh, if I string them together like this, I could sing this melody. And I'm, I should say this just so that you're aware I mean, I sang in the uh, church choir when I was seven years old, sang in school choirs. So I was a singer even before I was a guitar player. So the idea of melody in my head, being able to sing things, that made it easier once I had a guitar in my hands to be sort of writing music and coming up with melody at the same time. And, and the lyrics would come sort of as the last stage of that development. Now, having said that, and you're asking me about how it how it's gone over the course of my whole career. This last project that I did, I did something that I'd never done before. And that is, I said, okay, I'm not even gonna touch a guitar. I'm just gonna sit down with a notebook and I'm going to write lyrics. And so in a very sort of Bob Dylan way, I was kind of writing stuff in my head. It was more about the words and the lyrics first. And then the melodies and the chord changes, I could hear them in my head, but I hadn't really picked up a guitar yet. So then there were some songs where you get to, you, you sort of got the whole page of lyric and you're going, okay, this is certainly taking shape. I can see the architecture of this now. I can see the verses and choruses and where the hooks are paying off. And now you're feeling the rhythm and the meter of it. Then you're feeling sort of the, what I would call melodic contour, where you're going to be going up and where you're going to be going down. And those instincts are, they're very strong in my, you know, inside my head. So... When I, once I picked up the guitar, I found it really easy to sort of arrive at, oh, this song is really growing legs and starting to walk around now. It really, it's, it's turning into something. Now, having said all that, I was only ever aiming to have something that would be voice and guitar. So, you know, I kind of knew the guitar's got to be able to carry this. That's what I have to worry about. When I would work on a project like, say, with Mike Schotten, that's a whole different process where... You're actually writing inside the computer sometimes. You're coming up with a riff or a, a little idea, and you know now you're sort of copying and pasting, and you're you know it becomes a digital process. So there's lots and lots of different ways to skin the cat, and I've pretty much done them all at some point in my life. But um, I really did enjoy the whole idea of writing inside my head and sort of being lyric first, being very folky about it all. It's something I've never done. How often do you write nowadays? Uh, every day. I think it was John Hyatt was talking about, you know, doing, um, it was like a job, you know, he, he rented a space, he'd get up and he'd, you know, have his breakfast and get a coffee, you know, go to the office, sit down, start writing. Now, he probably had a publishing contract and a recording contract that he had to fulfill. And so he treated it like going to work. I'm not exactly that disciplined, but I pretty much, if I don't journal every day, I certainly blog on my website for my members forum every day. I have my uh, website administrator give me a file. So I said, can you give me a do Word document that's got all of my posts since the website started? And there was over 5,500 pages of <laughs> single lines. There's a massive editing job ahead of me to be turning some of that into you know readable book form but uh, i've never suffered writer's block i've always been pretty prolific and you know i mean i'll readily admit that a lot of it is it's kind of sometimes verbal diarrhea you know or or things that you know they they don't really have any value but i mean People move mountains so that they can get at the diamonds, right? That's the metaphor I like to use. <laughs> when you're teaching songwriting, is there maybe something you could point to, a uh, standard approach for you that you always teach your students on how to craft a song? Uh, well, uh, you know, I mean, yes, sure. Uh, the, the first thing I, that I would mention quickly is the psychology of it, that you have to give yourself permission. And then you have to give yourself permission to try and be great, to say, no, I am great, I, I can be great, and to go for that. Because we're our own worst enemies often when it comes to creativity. 
So that's that's one of the first lessons. And of course, hand in hand with that is the whole thing that, you know, all the judges on American Idol always tell everybody, oh, you've got to make the song your own. You've got to really be yourself. I really want to know who you are. I want to see you in this. And I think that and in, you know, any writing class, teachers will say, you know, you got to write what you know. And um, so there's an honesty and a truthfulness that has to be in writing of any kind. But in, in terms of a, a very practical thing, I think you've already touched on it. I mean, the thing that I would uh, emphasize to all writers is you have to do it every day. There's a discipline to this. Uh, and just by doing that, you're going to develop your, your muscles, your, your voice. It's going to come just because you're doing it. And you're going to start to develop your instinct as to what's good. You're going to critique your own stuff before it, your pencil even drags across the page, you know. Um, so there's my primer 101 for you. Now, they told me I only had 20 minutes. I have, yeah. I have a few questions about the documentary. Do we need to wrap it up? Well, it, it, you know, if you can have enough, two more minutes, but then I, I have to, you know, prep for my next one. I got and you. of course... Could you hear the dog barking in the background there? I could. Was that the alarm? <laughs> no, but uh, if, this was, if this was supposed to be for broadcast, you know, now we've had some audio interference. Oh, that's fine. I'm a big dog fan. Fire away your questions and I'll try and answer them in 15 words or less. Well, I just had heard that you had watched an initial cut of the upcoming documentary. Is it still called Lay It on the Line? Triumph, Lay It on the Line? Uh, you know what? I don't know. I think that that's what they still had pasted in on the second rough cut. So that may be what they go with. Um, but, uh, you know, there was sections of it even in the second cut that um, they hadn't filled in some spaces yet. So, and of course, the COVID thing throws everything into, uh, they were intending, I think, to release in the fall, they may still hold to that schedule, but they were going to do it at the Toronto International Film Festival. And so the, I'm sure the film festival is, you know, trying to jump through different hoops and figure out what they're going to do. So I don't know what will happen, but um, I do think it's great what I've seen. It's, and, of course, it's surreal. It's weird to, this is your life. <laughs> you know, oh, I bet. It's, it's kind of a weird thing. And it's, you're going back a long way. And so you're, you're not going back just to the glory of it. You're also going back to the, oh, my God, this is other, you know, when I decided I wasn't, wanted to quit and leave and, it's like uh, Gibran, you know, it's a tear and a smile. There's so interesting stuff. Well, that's what I was wondering, if anything came up that you kind of either forgot about or did it reignite any animosity or has everything been healed already and now it's just reflecting on it? Yeah, it, you know, uh, we're good. Like, old grown-ups, you, know? <laughs> you know. So, and that stuff, it is ancient history, you know, because we did resolve our issues a long time ago, and uh, we, we've sort of come to terms with that in, in very adult, grown-up kinds of ways. Um, I mean, having said that, it's still, it's not great when you're revisiting, you know, things in your life that give you sorrow, and, and, and um, you know, it was not an easy time from 1987 through to about 1993, it was a bad time in my life when it came to those guys, but it doesn't change the fact that for 13 years we were bonded at the hip, and for a large chunk of that time it was three musketeers, you know. So, yeah, uh, it, there's some motion in it for sure. Two 